I am thrilled to welcome another wonderful group of experts. Joining us to share insights and more solutions is Renee Shaw. Renee is Durham County's Mental Health Court Coordinator. Kate Dewberry. Kate is a partner with the law firm Pointer and Sproul, and Shireen Carrico. Shireen is the founder and CEO of the Promise Resource Network. We're gonna focus on some specific populations in this segment, but before we jump in, I wanna remind our guests that people on Facebook want to give you questions and comments, and I wanna remind those of you on Facebook to please go ahead and get those in as early as you can by commenting in the chat box. Yeah, okay, now that I've taken care of that housekeeping, Shireen, let's start with you. We saw one really innovative solution featured in that last story. Share with us some other ways that community leaders can work to address the growing rates of mental illness in our state. Yeah, so you know, I, I will use the illustration of, of one of the, the things that we're doing here in Charlotte. Um, so Promise Resource Network is completely peer led, which means that we are an organization that is staffed entirely by people that are in recovery from mental health and substance use issues. And we utilize that lived experience to create an accessible space. We do not accept insurance. Um, we do not require insurance and everything that we do is free. So in terms of the access barrier challenges, an organization like ours is a zero barrier access environment. And what we offer is both putting resources and supports in the hands of people. So we go out to people in their home, in their community, wherever they are comfortable. They can also come to us if they're comfortable. We also have a virtual platform if that is accessible to folks. And we have a 24 hour a day, seven day a week phone support line uh, for anybody to call in our community that is experiencing emotional distress and wanting to work through it. Wow, this is very impressive. So let me turn to you, Kate, for a moment. Uh, obviously, we're seeing a lot of mental health-related issues um, arise in schools. We're also seeing them arise in the workplace. So what are some innovations in the workplace that have come out of this moment with the pandemic and that are likely here to stay with good reason? Sure. Uh, thank you for having me today. So I think that employers have, um, as a result of the increase in remote work, the barriers between an employee's home life and their work life have broken down a little bit, um, which is, is possibly a good thing. You know, when we were all working from our homes and having calls and our dogs and our kids jumping in, um, it, it really kind of broke down those barriers, which I think have, has been helpful. It also helped employers to realize that um, there is some flexibility in where employees perform the work and when they perform the work. And so I think a lot of employers are now examining their policies around remote work um, and, and flexibility for employees. And so, you know, doing that and giving employees options um, and really focusing on what works specifically for the team and making sure that employees can get their work done in the, the best way possible that also balances their needs outside of work. I think, you know, a lot of employers are, are now making that shift as a result of the pandemic. But it, it, it feels like employers are doing more than making concessions about where and when work might be. Uh, maybe this is just me, but, but, but I think it, it feels safer to say to your employer these days, I'm just feeling burned out or I'm just really stressed or I, whatever the case may, may be. And, and can you talk a little bit from your perspective about how employers respond to that kind of new openness? Yeah, I think that employees are feeling more empowered to come forward and ask the questions. Um, and whereas before, you know, employers are really limited in helping employees if they don't know what the issues are, right? And so there is some uh, destigmatization 
politicization around coming forward and, and speaking up about what you need and knowing what the options are. I think also um, employers now are really seeing the value in investing in a good EAP program, that's their employee assistance program, and really promoting that. So I think the conversations in the workplace around you know, that employers have accommodation policies, um, that employees are protected if they seek accommodations, that they can come forward, and that there are more options than just working and not working if somebody is, is experiencing a mental health issue, that there are shades of gray there and there are options available to them. I think that has really changed the dialogue. Thank you for that. So, Renee, one of the other places that these mental health-related issues show up is in the judicial system. Could you talk a little bit about what is a mental health court and what role does that play in helping individuals get the treatment they need? Okay. Thank you for inviting me. And the mental health court in Durham County is designed to address the issues for individuals experiencing symptoms of severe mental illness or severe persistent mental illness. And what we do is offer them treatment and have their case dismissed instead of going through the traditional court system. And as the mental health court team, what we do is we connect those individuals to treatment to services. You know, if you have insurance or whether you have don't have insurance, we connect you to the treatment. And the Durham County Criminal Justice Resource Center, we provide some services for individuals where we don't charge, but for those individuals where the, the symptoms may be too severe, they need extra support that we can't provide, we connect them with community mental health providers. And so, Renee, uh, is that the diversion model, or are there other diversion models for people who have mental health um, concerns. That is one diversion model for the court system, but there are also diver other diversion models such as the models that the city of Durham is um, going, getting ready to start where they have a pilot program where they have a clinician embedded into the um, 911 center. They'll have a crisis team for individuals to go out into the community, you know, instead of like if you have a simple charge up as, such as someone um, trespassing. You know, they have a crisis team to go out instead of having the police to go out and address the issue. You know, if it's a mental health issue, let's get those individuals who treat mental health or get those individuals connected to treatment. Uh, terrific. Um, so I want to pick up on that, Shireen, if, if I might. Well, what are some opportunities to expand the availability of these kinds of services and innovations in some of our rural communities. We've heard Charlotte, we've heard Durham, both places with a lot of resources and personnel. How do we extend that to people who don't live in dense areas of the state? Yeah, that's a great question. So one of the reasons why we opened up the 24-7 um, peer and warm line during COVID, it was actually within 24 hours of, of our state going on lockdown, is because even when people don't have technology, they often have access to a phone. And what we found in the year and a half um, that we, were, we started, that we had 32,000 callers from all over North Carolina, from the Eastern coast and incredibly rural communities, all the way to the mountains accessing that type of support. We kept the data around the frequency of the times that people were calling, the reasons why they were calling, which mental health was a primary reason. And we had everybody from people that had been involved in mental health services in systems to first responders and teachers calling that, that line for support. It's an example of creating access in a rural community. The other one is we have to go out to people. You know, we cannot disconnect mental health from so social drivers of health. We can't disconnect poverty and access for mental health issues. And for people to have access, we need to go to them. That needs to be standard practice in a rural community to be able to offer supports. And then the third one is non-traditional supports. Your first panelist talked about the many reasons why people can fear to access clinical behavioral health services, but those aren't the only type of supports and resources that are available to folks that we have to really look at replicating and scaling in rural communities and communities that have experienced historical trauma in the name of treatment. 
I'm taking it all in. Thank you. Um, Kate, I'm going to go back to you for a second to talk about employers because I actually think that's a place in rural communities where people might be able to access service. So, so help us understand as your counseling clients, why is it important for employers to make the mental health of their employees a priority? And, and I guess the converse question is, what's at stake if they don't? Yeah, so I think employers, you know, have long known that retention um, is incredibly valuable. It's very expensive to bring in and train new employees. You have employees who have been there a long time, who know their job, who are good at their job, um, and, a, and a part of employees staying around and continuing to do their job um, is that they feel that they're in an environment that's supportive of them, um, that, that recognizes that they may have challenges um, that they face and supports them during those times of challenge. So I think um, for employers, you know, in order to deal with the, the great resignation and the, the turnover of employees, one way to do that is to really invest in supporting the employees you have um, and providing, you know, access to EAP and also, you know, I think employers are looking more now at what low cost things can we do, you know, having a weekly lunch or a check in with the team, you know, training supervisors to recognize issues related to mental health and checking in with their employees. So really using the employer as a way to make sure that, you know, in these communities, maybe where people aren't talking about it, um, individuals feel supported um, and, and like they have someone to go to and, and ask for resources if they need it. Great, great. Um, we've got a bunch of questions coming in from Facebook, so let's now take some of those from our audience on Facebook Live. Um, Larry asks, um, with the short session of the North Carolina legislature starting, is there any pending legislation to address this issue or does the panel believe there should be? There jump is. in, well, jump I in. Can, okay, I can speak. Um, there is a piece of legislation that is about replicating peer run programs as an alternative to confinement, hospitalization and police involvement, piloting them throughout the state and making them open access. So um, irrespective of insurance payment, free open access spaces. So that is one piece of legislation that is looking at that there is another about data around the use of involuntary treatment in North Carolina. Um, and there is one that actually passed around using non-police response for people experiencing emotional distress. And I think one of the panelists earlier, is, earlier had talked about uh, that particular um, project as well. Terrific. Anybody have anything else to jump in and share with Larry? All right, we'll go to another question. Scarlett asks, why should insurance be required for someone experiencing a mental health crisis? Um, and Shireen, I'm just, I'm gonna give that to you since this is your space. You know, Scarlett, that is a brilliant <laughs> question. I can tell you, we can make the health case, we can make the access case, and we can make the case for outcomes. We've been doing this for 17 years in our community, and we can make the cost savings um, case. What we cannot make is the business case, right? We as an organization cannot make money, if you will, by being funded the way that we are funded, by not using insurance. We do not have that cushion that is built into the billing um, situation, the billing circumstances and structure where we have extra money or a surplus of money for every time we bill for services. That means that as an organization, we literally get paid what we put out, right? It's a cost reimbursement contract, which means that any additional funding, any flexible funding to start new programs or to work on innovation or to serve new communities, we have to rely on other sources of funding like fundraising and things like that. From a business perspective, um, that is not necessarily the favorable, favorable place to be as a behavioral health agency. For us, it is a perfect place to be because that means that we are not limited by insurance, the insurance requirements. Our folks do not need a referral. They do not need a clinical assessment or anything diagnostic based. All they need is to say, I want to be a part of it. It makes sense from a health perspective. 
we can't necessarily make the same business argument. So a great answer and good insight into how your program works and how it gets funded and how much work it takes to make this funding model work. Next question, please. This comes from Mary Ann, who asks, what kind of stigma may cause people to hesitate to speak openly about their mental health issues? Such a big and important question. And um, Renee, you want to take this? Yes, I can take that one. Um, individuals are afraid to say their stigma because it'll hurt hurt them, whether it's getting a job. Sometimes um, when people hear you have a mental illness, people step back from you out of it like, okay, is something going to happen? Are they going to do something while they're here? So people are afraid of what they don't know. And that's a big issue with stigma. You really don't know what the symptoms are or how they're going to be exhibited. But it's the unknown. You watch TV and it's been sensationalized about how, oh, this happened this way. And mental health, it doesn't happen the same way for everyone. It happens based on what that person has experienced, the trauma. So many things make mental health symptoms exhibit itself. So that's, it's just afraid of how someone is going to treat you, how is going to prevent you from getting something, whether it's a job or being in an activity. People are just afraid of how it can prevent other things in their lives from happening. Yeah, I think it's totally right. You don't know what the ramifications of disclosure might be because you don't know what stereotypes people have in their head about whatever it is you might be, you might be experiencing. Um, Anybody else want to weigh in on this issue of stigma? Yeah, I think that employers are in a powerful position here. You know, oftentimes they'll draft handbook policies and, and have things about accommodations in the workplace, but there's a lot of legal jargon in those policies, and it doesn't really translate to an employee what it means to me and what happens if I come forward and say something and what are the risks to me. And so I think if employers, really this is a moment to take a look at your policies and um, translate them for the employee. Where do I go? Who do I talk to? What will happen next? What are, what are my rights? What does retaliation even mean? And, and how do I raise those issues? And then, you know, having a policy is one thing, but if you, you know, provide it to an employee when they start their job and then they don't see it again for five years or no one talks about it, it's not effective. So it should be part of an annual conversation where you, you train your employees and you talk to, you know, let's talk about real life examples and what this means for you. And that can really help destigmatize it and make employees feel more empowered to bring these issues up in the workplace. Absolutely. Kate, as a lawyer myself, I have to tease you about being the lawyer complaining about legal jargon <laughs> in the employee handbook. That's just, that's just perfect. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Next question, and please. Can I add to the, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, please. Can I just add to the stigma question? An extension of stigma being fear. So I came into mental health services when I was 13. That's when I received my first mental health diagnosis. And the reality of the situation is uh, sometimes treatments can feel traumatizing, right? And so people can fear talking about mental health issues for fear of things like forced treatment for fear that they are going to lose their independence or their freedom. Um, those are real fears that are based in the truth of how our behavioral health system needs to evolve to understand trauma and create services and supports that are healing and wellness-based rather than anchored in pathology and illness-based systems. And so we have a a lot of work to do to reform our behavioral health systems so that people are attracted to receiving supports regardless of the stigma. They are treated respectfully. They are, they are walking away, getting something out of it that they feel was helpful and that they are not re-traumatized in the name of treatment. Thank you for that, Shireen. All right, next question. Um, how can communities provide more urgent care mental health facilities and addiction services? Um, and Shereen, I'll start with you. It comes down to funding. 
right? So part of it is the funding. These are not inexpensive environments to be able to operate. I will tell you that I, um, number one, I, I don't believe that we have a shortage of, of money coming in. As a matter of fact, looking at some of the dollars, we don't have a shortage of money, but we do need to reallocate the money that we are spending, right? So if we look at, for example, the amount of money we are spending for one day of hospitalization, on average in North Carolina, it's about $2,100 a day. We could save a significant amount of money if we reinvested that in prevention and diversion away from the most costly and least effective way of serving people. And yet in our state, we are up around 91% of involuntary hospitalization. So we are spending our money in ways that ultimately are not resulting in greater benefits, are more costly. And we would have to, I mean, there would have to be an overhaul of the way that our system is designed and funded and prioritized and some of the biases that exist within mental health um, service delivery systems. Um. Renee, I know she's singing your song, but I'm going to keep going on these questions because we've got quite a few more, and I want to see how many we can get through. Kristen asks, should we implement mental health first aid in schools by hiring community partners so that we don't burn out our social workers, counselors, teachers, and other staff? Great question, given the story we saw. Renee, do you want to take a stab at that? Yes, I would definitely like to take a stab at that one. Um, we should do mental health first aid everywhere, in churches, anywhere where they would allow us to come in, we should do mental health first aid. You know, the pandemic has made mental health, like, uh, it put it in the forefront even more. And so if we train or teach everyone mental health first aid, there'll be more people who can recognize symptoms. There'll be more people who know, okay, my family member is in trouble. What do I do? Who do I contact? Where do I go? Mental health first aid is very important to our community and we should get the information out there even more. Thank you. All right, next question. Shereen, this has got to come to you. The question is, how can other communities get an organization like Promise Resource Network? And this is coming from Bibi. It's a great question, Bibi. So, you know, first of all, every community has local leaders and local talent, and we need to look from within our community. Every community is not um, designed the same way, right? So. I started this organization in Mecklenburg County. Thank goodness it was Mecklenburg County because I think I would have been kicked out of most other counties 17 years ago, talking about people with mental health issues, running an organization and serving people. Thank goodness we're a little bit further down the road than that, but we can't just take one example and one model and put it in another community without recognizing the local culture, the local resources, who the allies are, who your leaders are in the recovery space who um, can come together as a community and start planning and organizing this. We know it works. It can easily be replicated. It needs to be scaled, but we need to work. Other communities, frankly, need to have the um, desire, the appetite, the energy to replicate something like we're doing in Charlotte. I, I love that. So scaled, replicated, but contextualized for the assets that the particular community has, that's, that's terrific. Next question, please. Um, this question is, how can we shift the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services to give more serious consideration to alternatives such as peer-operated crisis support? Anybody have a thought about that? Sounds as though we should have directed that to the last panel since we had somebody from NCDHHS, but. All right, I'm hearing no takers. I'm going to the next question. This is great. Is it harder to get men to discuss mental health or seek help? And if so, why? I think that I'll take that question. Um, Good. I think that is, it just depends on who the man feels comfortable with. If the some men feel comfortable speaking with women, some men don't feel comfortable. If you if that person feels like they can relate to you, they'll open up. It may take a few sessions, but an individual will open up once they start to feel comfortable. You just have to get that person 
to feel as though you are, they are being heard and that you're going to offer support to them in the way in which they need. Thank you, Renee. I'm going to take one more question. And this is related. Lee asks, what is the importance of trained, culturally aware professionals? Um, and Shereen, I'll give that last one to you. Oh, it's everything. And, and it's culture from a variety of different perspectives. It's, it's culture in terms of, of race and ethnicity. It's culture in terms of gender identity and sexual orientation. It's the culture of poverty and it's the culture of patienthood. There's a lot that goes along with understanding culture. And to have somebody in front of you that um, affirms your experience and doesn't try to um, either reduce it, pathologize it, label it, or just discount it, is really critical to ongoing engagement and people walking away like they're getting something that is effective for them. There has to be culturally relevant um, services and supports and resources. The other thing I just wanna add to the question about mental health first aid um, is I, I am actually more of an advocate of trauma training, right? And, and here's the reason why mental health first aid re really does look at behavior through the lens of symptomatology, through the lens of clinical diagnostic criteria we are seeing right now collectively the trauma around us. This conversation could not be more timely with what happened in Texas yesterday. And what I fear and what I experienced as a person coming into services is behavior can easily be translated into clinical uh, pathology rather than uh, recognizing behavior as signs of trauma. Everybody needs to be trauma trained and resilience trained. All of our teachers, our first responders, our family members, and our young people in schools need to understand how trauma impacts our nervous systems and how to self-regulate and how to support people through trauma. That is also part of the cultural relevancy. Um, thank you, Shireen, for the reminder of the moment in which we all sit as we have this conversation. It's a tough, it's a tough moment. Um, Renee, Kate, Shireen, thank you for all you do and thank you for spending some time with our viewers and sharing your thoughts and hearing their questions. I appreciate you. I, I, I wanna also say thank you to all the leaders who were featured in this episode's stories. You know, these folks generously allow us to share their inspirational work together, and we're grateful for that. And then finally, hey, we never end this program without thanking you, our amazing audience, not just for watching, but for engaging. You know solutions are out there if we work together. I'm Anita Braun-Graham. This is NC Impact. <laughs>